everybody. This is World Building with Leanne Merciel, featuring um, our author guest of honor, Leanne Merciel, Paizo creative director, James Jacobs, and me, Linda Zayas Palmer, a developer at Paizo. So everybody on Twitch and here, welcome. Um, we're going to get started off here today. Leanne has prepared a presentation on the subject of world building, and the two of us will be chipping in and adding our thoughts as we go along and afterwards. And then at the end, we'll be taking questions. Thank you, yes. So we're going to open this with a, I hope, not excruciatingly dull lecture, but I make no promises as to that. Um, before I start, can I ask how many people, and this is not an either or, it's totally fine if you want to pick both, but how many people are here because you're interested in world building as it pertains to fiction writing? Okay. <laughs> and how many, man, you don't get an opinion, you're just oh. a panelist. So. Panelists get opinions too. <laughs> and how many people are here because you're interested in it for game purposes, whether as a GM or as a player? Okay, cool. So a lot of the considerations are going to be the same, but the tools and the techniques that you use to achieve them will be slightly different. You put the emphasis in different places, and of course when you're running a game, it's a collaborative enterprise, so it's not just about you getting to control all of the characters' reactions. You have to leave room for your players to drive the story. So it becomes a little bit different in that respect. The point of world building, whether you're writing a story or running a game, is not actually literally to build a world. It's impossible and it's largely a waste of time. What you're looking for are to achieve two things. You want to figure out how to build conflict and intrigue. Those are your two goals. Everything that you do in service should be in service of one of those two goals because the conflict is what drives the story. That's what actually propels the narrative forward. And intrigue is what deepens the narrative and makes it feel like it matters. So you're creating the illusion of reality, but you're not actually trying to create a reality. Um, and even Tolkien, who's often held up as the person who told the story so he could build the world, wasn't literally building a world. I'm sure he didn't bother mapping out the patterns of pig and pigeon migration in Gondor. He was just building a mythology, so it was a story that justified the telling of a different story. But he wasn't actually literally building a concrete world. Um, so to give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about here, most of the time, when you're reading a book, the author doesn't bother spelling out where the characters get their drinking water from. It's just not important. It's assumed that they have drinking water. We're going to blow past that. It's not important to the story unless it is important to your story, at which point you can build it out. So I'm going to pull from a real world example. Prior to its collapse, Yemen was and is a very poor city, or a very poor country rather, I'm sorry, and uh, one that had very little drinking water. And so one of the uh, problems that they ran into was that people would hoard drinking water in their homes. And because they didn't have a lot of places to put it, they would just use open buckets. Mosquitoes would breed in the buckets, and the mosquitoes spread malaria and dengue fever throughout the city. So at that point, the lack of the drinking water actually does become an important element. If you're running this as a game, you can say, why are these tropical diseases appearing in a desert environment? They shouldn't be there, they're not natural to this area, so you have a mystery there. Where is it coming from? Why is this happening? I am, if you're writing it as a story, you might want to focus more on the conflict element. And here I want to tease out two separate things. Danger is not always the same thing as conflict. The danger in this scenario is the disease. But the disease does not present a conflict in and of itself because there's nothing to fight against. There's no adversary. It's just a disease and some mosquitoes. You can't really do much about that. The conflict there is with the people because these people need water to drink. They need water to live. You can't take the water away from them, even with the mosquito larvae inside of it, without severely endangering them. And so that's the conflict. That's the part that you would have to resolve to drive the story forward. So does anybody have any questions about that part so far? No? Cool. Either everybody is really bored or I'm doing a great job of explaining this. <laughs> I'm going to pretend it's the good one. Hey, yes? No, I'm just getting bored. OK, cool. <laughs> um, so now that we understand that these are the goals, the next question is how do you actually do that? How do you achieve that? Um, I'm not going to pretend that Jared Diamond is unproblematic in all ways. He wrote Gun Germs and Steel, Collapse, the new book Upheaval is getting kind of really mixed reviews. I haven't read that one yet. But I will say that when I read Gun Germs and Steel, it was a real light bulb moment for me because that was when it occurred to me, oh right, 
you start with the geography. You start with the geography first and everything else arises naturally from there. So even though his approach isn't necessarily 100% accurate in terms of explaining real life societies, it is really useful in terms of reading that to develop a framework for how to build fictional societies. And so through that lens, I would definitely recommend taking a look at one of his books sometime. It's just an interesting perspective on how to build things from the ground up, starting with the geography, which is key particularly for pre-industrial civilizations, which is mostly what we're talking about here. Magic can kind of add an element of uh, complication, but we'll get to that later. For the most part, people don't have the technology to completely transcend their environments. I mean, nobody does, but particularly in a classic fantasy setting, they usually don't. So when you're evaluating how geography affects your story, look first at the map and then figure out based on the climate here, based on the topography. The first thing you want to figure out is scarcity and abundance. What is rare and what is plentiful in this place? And why and how? What are the natural resources? Where do people get their food from? How much food do they have? What skills arise from that? What industries arise from that? How stable is the population likely to be? And what kind of government would arise from there? And then you look at how are the resources exploited or maintained? Generally, across human history, people tend to undervalue whatever is plentiful. If they have a lot of it, they tend to assume it will always be there, it's not worth a whole lot, you can kind of take it for granted. And they tend to place greater value on rarer things, by and large. Um, people also tend to discount the future and err on the side of overexploiting what they have right now, even at the risk of exhausting or ruining that resource. This isn't always true. I mean, if you're working in fantasy again, you can say that other races and other peoples have different ways of regarding this, but by and large, this is true for humanity, so it's a good baseline to work from, and then you can veer from there as serves your story. And then you would also wait, how is the resource valued culturally, and how does that valuation shift over time? Um, I'd like to read a short section from a book called Cadillac Desert. It's by an environmentalist named Mark Reisner. And the context of this quote um, is that in the 1930s, we Americans built a lot of dams, particularly across the American West. And the reason why we did that was to get hydroelectricity and irrigation for farmlands. We did this at the cost of considerable environmental damage. So we destroyed a lot of salmon habitats and things like that. So here's an example of we have a thing that is plentiful, the salmon, and we have a thing that is rare at the time, which is hydroelectric power in the 30s. And, um, I want to read the quote because I think it's a really good illustration of how valuation, abundance, and scarcity all play together. So by the 1970s, America's values were utterly different because everyone's experiences had changed. People who came through the Depression didn't just eat salmon, they survived on it, and they were sick of it. It was known as poverty steak because it sold for 10 cents a pound. Those who were born later could only listen to stories of rivers you could cross on the backs of salmon of creeks where they crowded themselves out of the water and flopped into the woods. Suddenly there was plenty of cotton and fruit grown on irrigation water. There was plenty of cheap steak because subsidized water was raising millions of cattle on irrigated alfalfa and grass. There was plenty of cheap hydroelectricity just two or three generations after the Depression, when many rural towns in the West had no electricity at all. All things man-made had become plentiful, but a great menu of things once abundant in nature had become scarce and now people were demanding some of it back. So there you can see a shift over time in how a thing that is valued changes. And um, what you can do with that, another thing that you can do with that is tie in the cultural importance. So here in Salmon, or sorry, here in Seattle, which might as well be here in Salmon, yeah. really. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's very deeply ingrained in a lot of traditions and a lot of, you know, people's identity is tied to this very important and culturally valuable research resource. So when that starts to become rare, there's a lot of nostalgia and identity and importance tied up in that too. And you can bring that out very usefully once you decide what in the world that you're building occupies that role. What is the thing that used to define this people that is now becoming harder to get, that they're now at risk of losing. What is recovering that worth to them? That's another thing that you can pull out. So that's scarcity and abundance. I would say another thing to consider are pressures and limitations, the big one being population size. 
What is the size of the population? How does it fluctuate over time? Um, food and population size is the classic example. So if you have a population boom in good years, and then you have flooding or crop failures, plagues of locusts, massive warfare, suddenly there's not enough food to sustain people, and that creates enormous pressure on your population to move, to either find new food sources or to go out there and conquer new lands, or just to flee. But you get a lot of instability that way, and you get a lot of governmental collapse. So this, to use an example from Galerian, you can kind of um, infer certain things from a society based on how it's set up. So for example, we have in Belkson, we have orc hordes. We have a lot of orc hordes. They are always attacking people. They get lawn mowered all the time, and they still come back. So from this, you can infer that one, there's probably a lot of food there because they don't ever seem to be starving. They just get their heads cut off. So they must have a lot of food, and it must be largely hunter and gathering food because they don't have time for agriculture. And also, as far as I'm aware, there's not a whole lot built up about orc farmers, so they're probably just killing other things and eating them. So you can infer that there's a very rich ecosystem there, and they have a lot of wild game to hunt down. Um, we know that Nadal under Zonkuthan is very stable and has been stable for a very long time from which you can infer that they have really tight controls on their population, which was something that I wrote out when I was um, asked to do that part because it was logical that if you have a very stable government for a very long time and not a whole lot of food because their entire country is blanketed in shadow, then you're going to have basically replacement level population and not a lot of variation beyond that. So you can say that, all right, most families are going to have two kids. Not having two kids is going to be a little weird, having more than two kids is going to be a little weird, and by and large, they're not very militaristic because they can't be. They cannot afford to lose big armies. They don't have the population to do that. So once you know some things in about your world, you can figure out what logically must fit with that. And so when you're working in a tie-in environment like Galarian, you are given certain pieces of information, and from that, you know, working through this framework, you can fit in the other pieces that need to be there to make that picture make sense. Um, a couple of other things that I would draw out in terms of pressures and limitations are developmental stresses and ambitions. Um, if you play Civilization, which is a really great game, it's so well designed, but there are some resources that just do not matter until you get to a point in the game where like, okay, now I can use coal, now I can use uranium. These things were worthless before, now suddenly they're really valuable. And that too changes the equilibrium over time. And then there are outside influences and internal schisms. One of the things that Paizo does really well in building its worlds is uh, recognizing that societies are not monoliths. There are always competing factions, people who want different things, people who disagree about how to achieve their given goals. And once you know what the stresses are in your society, you can figure out how would people line up on the different sides of this issue. Where would they cooperate? Where would they come into conflict? And it's good to know that both because it gives you more conflict to draw from in your stories and because it uh, lets you play around with point of view in more interesting ways, which I'll get back to in a second. You can also figure out religious and cultural practices once you know pretty much what the underlying pressures are. So you can figure out what customs are going to make sense here. For example, if water is really rare and precious, then giving water as a gesture of hospitality to somebody that you meet for the first time becomes a very significant token gift. It's literally, here, I'm going to save your life, you've crossed all this distance to come to my place, and that becomes a telling detail that tells you a lot about the world in that just small gesture. You can also figure out what religious beliefs are likely to seem useful to the people in that background and which are going to be reinforcing and which are just not going to make any kind of sense to them at all. And then you can figure out, okay, these religions probably don't fit with this particular corner of society. And you can figure out legacies of past conflicts and if the society has crumpled down from a prior golden age, you can figure out how they might regard the artifacts of that past glory. Like, how does that feel to them now? Um, for example, you know, pulling from another real world example, what is the value of your granddad's Nazi helmet in the attic? How do you feel about that? Is this a token of family shame? Is it great embarrassment that you have this horrible legacy 
that you would really rather just wall off in the attic and pretend like it never happened at all? Or do you maybe come from a Jewish family where it was like, this was a token of us fighting back. We fought back, we killed this guy, we kept that trophy even though it was so dangerous to have this as a signifier of how hard we resisted. Do you feel differently about that if you are an insecure teenage boy who's like fighting for some kind of identity, something to be proud about? Do you feel differently about it if you are an 80-year-old grandmother who has already lost a lot of people to violence and is just so over all of that? Um, you can weight that differently, you know, depending on what the societal context is and who your character is. Um, the last point that I want to talk about is once you have run through this kind of framework, you can figure out how you want to bring it to life. How would these pressures and expectations shape the point of view of your character? If you are writing fiction, you control the character's point of view, and you can use the lens of things that this character thinks about and cares about to say certain things about who they are, where they're coming from, and what they experience. Everybody has their preconceptions, everybody has their blind spots, everybody has the things that they notice at first glance when they encounter someone new. And that can be used to show both who the character is and what the setting is like, because you can kind of use that as a contrast to draw out new points. Um, to use another example, when we were on the plane coming over here, there were two people sitting in the seats in front of us, and they were both, you know, like young guys who hadn't, I got the impression that they had traveled a whole lot. And one of them was telling the other one about how he went to this, he was sitting in first class, he got a first class ticket, and they asked him, would you like to have some chicken? And he's like, sure, I'd love to have some chicken. And he was telling his seatmate, I thought I was gonna get the dinosaur nuggets. I thought I was gonna get the dinosaur shaped chicken nuggets. And that's not what he got because that's not what they serve you in first class. He was like, <laughs> and they gave me like this glazed chicken breast. And he's like, it's really good, but that's not what I thought chicken was gonna be. <laughs> and, and so I was like, that's awesome. I mean, that is great. <laughs> And also I was like, yeah, you know, actually, if I wanted the dino nuggets and they gave me the other stuff, I'd be like, this is, okay, fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but that tells you a lot both about the character and about the setting. So you can use that kind of detail if you're writing fiction. If you're running a game, it's a little bit harder. I mean, if you're building a character, like if you're the player character, then you can use that, you know, to bring your character to life. But if you're the GM, you can't say, and this is the emotional reaction that you have, because the player's going to be like, no, dude. And also, it's my character. Stop. Um, <laughs> But one thing that you can do as a GM is you can kind of bring this stuff out in loot. Um, most loot in a game is functional. It either is money, like it's cash value and they just sell it when they get into town, or it helps your players stomp monsters better. Those are basically the two loot functions. Um, if you are doing this, you can serve loot function number one, a thing that you can sell, but also in a way that conveys information about the environment. So. Um, for example, going back to the salmon example, you know, if you have an old salmon boat and it goes back centuries, you know, like this is an old boat, then it says something about this character's family background and their roots in the community and how long they've been involved. So there's a potential for great sentimental value and something to say about this character in addition to the cash value. Um, and I think that is pretty much all I had in terms of lecturing. So if you guys have any thoughts, anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I think that's all just r r amazing mm -hmm. uh, way to go about building a world. I think it's really, and one of the things that I do a lot when I'm building content is, is again, I look at the real world and, and you want to take things that are, you know, you're either familiar with or that have uh, precedent that you can then build on and then um, expand on it from there because once you take something from the real world, there's a lot of like you know historical documents and um, information that you can bring in and and explore in that way. Um, when you're building something for um, a game like a Pathfinder, it's it's kind of gets a little bit weirder and more complicated. As you were implying, you don't have control over the main characters, so you don't know what the main characters are going to be interested in. You kind of have to sort of guess, like, maybe they're going to play fighters, so I should do some more stuff like with the armies and stuff. Maybe they're going to play clerics, so I should have more temples and stuff going on. And uh, it's sort of difficult because when you start out, you don't know exactly what sort of thing you're going to be building. You just know that you need to have everything kind of covered. And knowing 
a lot about the society and uh, what sort of things uh, go on. Like if salmon is really important in the, in the culture because it's, it's become scarce, you can then expand from there and uh, maybe they have like, um, uh, they've started a salmon farm and all of their militaries are all about like guarding this, this resource or maybe as part of their religion or maybe um, there's like a group of druidic uh, like uh, factions in the area that are protecting the rivers and stuff like that and you can, you can expand on it there. And um, when you're building from, for a novel, you, you can focus in on what's important to the characters that you're focusing on. And you can't, like I said, you can't do that in a game. So my recommendation is you start really small. You don't want to detail an entire continent because you're not going to go to most of that continent in the game. Start small, pick like a little small town. Uh, when I started working on a, the first Adventure Path for Pathfinder, I wanted to start with a very small town, Sandpoint, because you can constrain yourself into one area. You don't have to map out an entire sprawling city. You got like maybe a hundred buildings at most. And um, I chose to set it in a region I was familiar with when I grew up, like the Northern California coast. So that way I didn't have to do a lot of extra work and like researching what the culture was like, what the geography was like, the climate and all of that. I already had that in my head because it's what I was used to. And uh, then that way you can just kind of drop in a little bits and pieces here and then you know, set the player characters loose in it. And it really helps if you do something like that because when you're expecting the players to go right and they, they go left, you can still draw on your, you know, your real world experience and uh, say, well, you didn't go up the river into the woods, but you went down to the beach. But I know that, for example, there's a, a beach down where I grew up called Bowling Ball Beach with a bunch of rocks on it that have been churned into like small sort of circular stones and it's kind of a weird sort of pattern of rocks. So I'll just throw that in as a detail and you know, if a player picks up on it, it's it's really helpful to be able to you know kind of be on your feet and improvise a little bit, and you don't really know where you're going to go. Um, fortunately, game sessions you know they don't last for super super long, and you don't play them nonstop. So you you finish your session, and then you know kind of where they're going to go next. And you're like, okay, they're really into the beach stuff. I've got a week till the next game, and then you can start focusing. And then as the weeks go on and your game continues you basically take their actions to kind of guide where you're going to go. And it's, it's, a, it's a very organic way to build a world. And if you do it well, uh, the players never realize that you didn't have all that stuff made up beforehand. So. And one of the decisions that you made in building Galera that I think is super helpful in working on adventures there is making it be the same size as Earth and the yep. same distance from the sun because then you really have that analog. You can look at the world yep. and you can say, okay, where does this correspond to roughly? Then what's this climate <laughs> going to be like? And you can expect that, okay, it has the same amount of gravity. So you can really pull from that experience. Yep. What's it going to be like to live on a mountainside? You can research what these real world, what these real world challenges are as opposed yeah. to having to... And you can say like, well, it's magic. It doesn't really matter. And that's mm -hmm. not really true because... Uh, it does matter. I like if if um, one of the things that always kind of bothered me about uh, other campaign settings was like, it's magic. It's got three or four moons in this guy. It's like, okay, that's kind of cool. What does that do to the tides? How does that affect <laughs> like you know how the ocean works? And it's like I'm not I'm not smart enough to know how multiple moons like flying around a planet would shift and change the tides. So then. Uh, that starts getting a little bit complicated. How werewolves work, you know? Is if you got like four full moons a year, I mean, does that mean they're always woofing out or all that type of stuff? Um, mm -hmm. It's it's really something that you can just do a throwaway line on and um, say that there's three, four moons in the sky. That really starts impacting a lot of assumptions you have about the the world that you're building. And it, it comes back to relatability, too. How yep. much can people feel that they can understand what it would be like to be a character in that world? Because yep. you're already having to imagine, you know, oh, these people have magic. Okay, you know, there's the there's this pantheon of gods. There's these factions. There's these kinds of things. And if you're having to then put into that, you know, oh, and there's three moons in the sky and rivers run backwards and things like that, then it, it just gets a little harder to, to put yourself in the place of the characters, at least in, in my experience. One of the really, really important things that I've learned uh, uh, in making, uh, you know, game con and world con and stuff like that is to listen to people who are smarter than you and to accept the fact that they know more about whatever's going on. Like, I spent, like, months drawing. I had a big sheet of hex papers, like, I'm going to map out my planet and draw on all these rivers and mountains and stuff like that. <clears throat> and I finished it, and it was, this, it was all colored and everything. It was all super fancy. I was proud of it, and I showed it to my, uh, my friends, and 
and one of them uh, was uh, studying geology, and he's like, your rivers are backwards. And that's the only thing he, he said. He didn't say anything else about us. <laughs> I could have at that point was like, fine, you can't play. <laughs> but um, he was right. All of the rivers I'd drawn, I, for whatever reason, had them flowing apart so that they were like giant deltas that would go on a continental thing all the way down to the ocean. And uh, rivers, that water doesn't flow apart. Water flows together. So there's multiple sources for a river and one you know, exit into the ocean. And uh, it's something that I really took to heart at that point, and I kind of turned into this uh, ogre when it comes to rivers on maps. Like that doesn't work that way. You're gonna have to fix it. <laughs> and you know, I'll see it in like even like um, actual like, like fantasy novels and stuff like that. It, it just sticks in my head. But it's the type of thing that if you shared your fiction with somebody and they know something that you didn't know, take that in and and, and help it to make a uh, it makes more of a shared world and it makes it a better world. I think that's a really good point. Um, one of the things that I was going to mention earlier is that you can use magic as a get out of jail free card, kind of, sort of, but you can also use it to make things really complicated. So since we're talking about rivers, um, and I'll go back to the hydrology example. So you could have, let's say we're in the river kingdoms over here, um, and we'll go back to the map in a second, but just glance at it right now. And you can see that there are a lot of really small kingdoms, and if you wanted to, you could have an upstream neighbor put up a big dam because they want to have that water for their farming or they want to reclaim some swamp land. And then their downstream neighbors who needed that for a fishery might be like, hey, no, stop, take that dam down or we're going to come fight you. And so the upstream neighbors might say, well, here is an overflowing bottle of water. You can just magically plant this down there, which kind of begs the question of why wouldn't you just use that for irrigation, but whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's say that this is, you know, the solution. OK, so the party goes out gets this bottle, gives it to the downstream kingdom. Everybody's supposed to be happy now, but it turns out that when you dam up the water, you're also damming up the silt. So their farmland is not being replenished. And it might well be that the pH value or the temperature in your ever flowing water is not right. It's too cold. The juvenile fish can't survive. It doesn't have little bug larvae in it. Your juvenile fish are starving to death. It has solved nothing. So if you want to be a stickler as a GM or as an author, you can say, actually, it's a lot more complicated than just introducing new elements into this whole ecosystem. Or you could say, that worked great. Well done, players. Mm -hmm. It really depends on your table style. But you can go either way with magic. It doesn't have to be a get out of jail free card, but it can be. You have that flexibility. I find that in, um, I, this is a bit of a different topic, but I find that in um, running games, the NPCs are really your primary vector through, and the conversations they have with the PCs are really your primary vector for sharing information. Because it's a lot more interesting for the PCs to learn about a culture by noticing, you know, what, in what ways does their general approach and behavior interact with the expectations and the reactions they get from people as opposed to like, okay, you know, now I'm going to roll a check. I rolled high knowledge. Okay, hold on, the GM's going to read like this paragraph and tell me, well, in this country, it was founded in this year, and yada, yada, yada. So it's, it's really good to be able to experience that organically. Although you do kind of run into the problem sometimes where you're just trying to world build and they think it's a clue that can get... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that actually, um, that's actually a really good trick you can do too. Like if you're talking about like, well, in this... Uh, area people really uh, are into trees and they do a lot of like trees are really important and they don't allow lumberjacks and stuff like that and you had maybe intended the fact that it was just that uh they are a bunch of druids and that they they venerate nature and all that and if you had a player that was like oh like seven sessions ago we had that ghost that was like haunting the the tree i bet this whole forest is filled with tree ghosts <laughs> and then the, the table's like oh tree ghosts yeah, that's it. <laughs> and one thing you can do at that point is you weigh that option and again this is like taking in something from somebody else that you know is either knows more or maybe you'd forgotten about the tree ghosts or something like that and then you can say like yeah, that's pretty interesting. Why don't you like have them make a religion check or something like that? And regardless of what they roll, it's like, yeah, there there is a strange sort of like shimmering in the woods that you notice. <laughs> yeah. The player characters then go into the woods, and it shifts from this like fight against like the the evil lumberjacks into exercising the forest of its evil you know tree ghost stuff, and uh, it makes an equally interesting um, story and and uh, experience of building out the world. Um, but uh, the players, 
feel like they figured out organically on their own, and it makes them feel smart because, like, oh, our GM put this sneaky little clue in that they thought we would forget. So that makes <laughs> you look really smart when it's like you're just. <laughs> it's it's really that's one of the things that I really like about particularly uh, shared world type stuff is um, you come up with one idea and somebody else comes up with one idea, and between the two of it, it's, it's greater than the sum of its parts, which is a really fun way to build a world. And when you're talking about collaborative world building, there's mm -hmm. sort of this this policy that we have at Paizo, which is every time you take a story hook and you close it out, try to build two more story hooks for someone else to pick up. Yeah. Because when you're working on this collaborative world, you always want to be expanding the mystery and the possibility rather than closing things off. Yeah. What else? Um, Maybe take questions, or do we have anything else? Or? Yeah, I don't know how we are on time right now. Um, well, I mean, we've Not talked halfway. about okay. Yeah, we've we've talked more. We've talked more broadly about like putting in the. We've talked more broadly about putting in the structure of the fundamental world, and we've talked also about some some techniques for um, some techniques for adding little details and how your players interact with that world, and um, and how you can use NPCs and things like that. Um, one thing that so primarily in my job, I'm working with the Pathfinder Society organized play. Um, and so you have these characters that are, um, they're going all over the world and they're experiencing all sorts of different cultures. So for that, it's important to let each, each individual place really stand out and have its own, its own feeling and its own meaning. Um, because if you have an adventure where exploration is a key part, you want to make sure like, oh, you know, this culture values hospitality. This culture does not allow you to openly display your religious symbols, so you better be careful, cleric. So this culture, this culture, and this culture, you know, the, the cleric is going to be valued for their mystical wisdom in this culture. The barbarian is going to be valued for their strength. And that also gives you a chance to, to let different players and different characters shine through through the cultural values of the location. And it's funny too, especially if you've got like that low charisma character or that character who's not usually the popular person or whatever, and then they come to a culture and it's like, oh my goodness, your alchemy is the best. How did you do that? And then the rest of the rest of the party is just like, oh no, oh no, don't let him talk for us, don't let him talk for us. And then he's just like, oh wow, look, everybody loves him now. So yeah. it can it can be fun certainly to um, when you're when you're building aspects of the world to consider Ways to uh, ways to build that around characters, and ways to choose locations and situations and factions to help engage the players that you have. So, in terms of why we have this map up here, I'm not really sure what you guys want to do. We can open it to just general Q and A. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that anyone has, or we can try to build out one of the locations in this map. It's totally up to you guys. Does anybody have a preference? Speak. Don't make me call on you. I will. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because what yes. the fuck? I don't have a huge preference on what. That's not doing. what I wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would like to ask: uh -huh. when you are building a world, do you tend to go more with the building a location and how the location functions, and then populate that location, or do you tend to do more of a build a culture and how that culture functions and all of its history and then build a world around that culture? That is a really interesting question. I don't know that it's as clean as picking one or the other. Um, if I'm doing tie-in work, usually some things will already be set. And so they'll say, you know, like, here's a region, write a story in that region. And then I'll look at the region first and try to figure out what conflicts suggest themselves from this area or from this culture. Um, other times, the story idea will come first, and then I'll pick out a spot that's not overused on the map and try to figure out how that location would change that story. Okay. Oh. Oh. So, um, government, politics, social intrigue. A lot of these kinds of things can, like, these are some themes that might come up in various campaigns. How, and these are things that in my experience at least, are very um, in-depth, things that are, there's a lot of intricacies to them. How would you suggest using world building to establish the, the complexity of creating governments and intrigue and social situations and how that can be applied into games effectively? <laughs> 
Um, I think it depends in part upon or how interested your players are in getting into the nitty gritty of things. Do they want to be, do they want this to be, okay, we're going to come in and we're going to maybe we talk to a few of the high level folks and we convince, we convince, you know, the king's counselor that the king should fund us through doing this quest or do they want to be involved in that intrigue? And if they do, um, it can be good to have them get to know some of the people more gradually, especially with, especially with intrigue. Um, it's great if, Everybody's got a secret that's not visible on the surface that you're going to slowly be that you're slowly going to be revealing over the course of time. I worked on the uh, the influence um, subsystem in uh, in Ultimate Intrigue, so that has uh, that is a system where you have these different people, and they have certain certain ways that it's easier to influence them, certain ways it's harder to influence them, um, certain secrets or secret identities or other things that they might have, and then ways that they may be able to help you or hinder you in the future based on based on what they, their opinion is of you. So I could certainly see doing something where you had, um, where you had sort of multiple influence encounters, um, where you have, um, where you build up. Um, so there's also the, um, in addition to the individual influence system, there's uh, an organizational influence system in Intrigue as well, which um, has to do with slowly building up your reputation with a group, which could be a, you know, a, a thieves guild but it could also be a faction within a particular government and the idea there is that in general you have organizations that like each other so if you improve your reputation with one then the, their allies are going to like you more but their but their enemies may start to turn against you so i think it's it's important to look at the way that the pc's actions influence not just who they're talking to at the moment but the other the other spinning wheels because all the other npcs are, are watching and looking on as well um, one thing I wanted to bring up real quick too is is for something like this you can absolutely draw upon as with everything else real world uh, uh, elements and stuff like that but it's the most important thing especially in a, a group setting where you're playing with a bunch of people is to know everybody's comfort levels know everybody's uh, uh, interests and all of that you don't want to I mean, people, you bring up topics like politics and religion and such, that's, those get really heated and, and uh, people get really passionate about it. So you want to make sure that you know your group and uh, know their, have, basically have their consent. And you wanna, if you want to do a big political thing that is like drawing upon like something going on in the real world, you don't want to do that if you know somebody in the group is going to be uncomfortable with that. You don't want to do it if you don't know. You want to make sure that everybody's comfortable before you start exploring that. And I honestly probably wouldn't. Um, I'd just have maybe two or three NPCs that the PCs would interact with primarily. I would figure out what those NPCs could and couldn't do, who they hated, who they liked, and then just let it run on personality from there. So it would kind of be shattered. You know, you've made friends with the Chelish colonial governor. The colonial governor can do X and Y, cannot do A and B, and now he's been assassinated. Oops, who did that? And I just kind of go from there. It's, it's more about the personalities they're going to interact with. They're not going to be looking at the government diagram on a table. You should know it, but they won't. Yeah. Uh, my question is, would magic potentially replace cargo cults in world building? <laughs> replace what? Cargo cults. It could, yeah. Um, one of the things that I really like about magic um, is that people know it exists, but most people don't really know how it works. So yeah, sure. They could put up superstitions. They could have all kinds of charades. I mean, we have more or less canonically still, I think, a person who's masquerading as a god. Um, <laughs> so there's all kinds of levels of like, people don't know, which makes it much easier to con them. Mm -hmm. Our next question comes from Twitch. Rising Phoenix GM asks, how do you avoid getting to a point where the world detail is just too big and too difficult to manage? I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's a tricky thing, because I mean, that's sort of some, one of the things that we're looking at right now. We've been doing Galarian stuff for you know 10 years, and now we're on an edition change. And it, it, it is, it's important that now and then, if you've got a lot of stuff going on, to maybe reset things. And if you've run, been running a game, say, in the River Kingdoms for five years, um, you may have like established so much lore and content and stuff that is starting to get uh, too much to manage. And, and you'll know when that starts to happen. It's going to be different for every, pe every person. And if it starts getting uncomfortable, that might be a good point to like switch somewhere else or maybe have somebody else GM or, or something like that. But it, it'll, it'll be varied, you know. Thorough notes are good. And if you're running in a if you're running in a particular region and you as a GM find that you're struggling to keep track of all the details, that's a really good sign that you've got a lot going on and your players probably aren't following everything that's going on too. It can be helpful to 
to make notes, to do refreshers, to have handouts for your players as well if you find that you're yeah. starting to, to get to that point. All right, uh, my question is about how you were sharing, talking about sharing world information th organically through NPCs. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just kind of wondering what are your thoughts about like Star Wars, how the beginning is just a big data dump at the beginning. Just is there a bright line as to when it's beneficial to do one versus the other? I wouldn't say there's a bright line. I think no. it depends upon the it depends upon the audience and the group. Um, the I mean, with the with the role playing game, it's a lot more interactive by its very nature, and so you can you can have a situation where somebody does something, and then you're dynamically and organically deciding how the world responds, as opposed to needing to set up a scene. And also, um, also with the role playing game, you're you're going to be playing for a lot longer than the length of a movie, so you have a lot more time to establish things than a movie is going to have. Yeah, I think there's absolutely no bright line. Um, the Wheel of Time has a lot of information about necklines. It has nothing to do with anything, but it's there. So I know the neckline of every fashion in every country in that world. Um, and there are people who like that. There are people who are extremely into that. In Game of Thrones, you know what all the feasts are. And again, there are people mm -hmm. who like that and people who are extremely into that. There are other people who would prefer to keep it faster paced. There's no line, it's just preference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My question involves tying in actual historical events, but altering the events to fit the world, or cultural uh, cultural uh, heritage, like using a Hellenistic uh, region in your world. How much would you adapt, or how much would you change? Um, again, that's that's going to be something that's really sort of personal preference. We've done. There's a lot of in Galarian, for example, that is just. You know, brand new, like the uh, Orcs of Dulcin, uh, for example, that's just purely this uh, fantasy. Um, there's there's elements of, you know, there's real world elements in there. But but then you look at something like uh, Minkai, for example, is very much based on uh, uh, medieval uh, Japan. And uh, you want to kind of try not to exceed your personal knowledge about it or your, your appetite for learning about it, because if you bring something like that in, you're no longer making everything up on your own. And uh, you will be confronted at some point by somebody that knows more about it. As a per great personal example, one of the characters I made up for uh, Rise of the Rune Lords is Amiko Kaijutsu. And um, I kind of made up her name. She's from Minkai, which is our Japan analog. And I kind of made up her name because it sounded kind of good. It's, it's fun to say. Um, and then somebody pointed out after it had been published and everything is you can't actually, sp I think it's a Miko, you can't actually spell uh, using uh, Japanese kanji and, and the characters, they just don't, it doesn't work that way. And so that was like, on one level, it's like, well, it's, it's Minkai, not Japan, so maybe they do. But at the same point, it's like, yeah, you caught me. I mean, that's, that's an element where you, you really don't want to overstep what you know. But again, if somebody knows more than you do, you know, accept it and all that kind of, it's sort of a rambling response to the question. I hope I answered it. Yeah, and I think particularly if you're looking at inspiration from, you know, if you're looking at inspiration from modern or recent cultures, it's also important to make sure that you are not relying on uh, on stereotypes and yeah. that you're doing your research so that somebody who has a connection to that culture, you know, is looking at it, they're not going to be looking at it and be like, what, what is this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now for another question from Twitch. Uh, Eleonori Lorenzo asks, is it harder to build a world for a fantasy setting versus a science fantasy setting? And do the panelists have any preferences? Which mm. one's paying me money? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's huge. Um, I think I prefer fantasy. Uh, well, no, I don't know. That's a tough question. I, it is tough. It's, okay. It depends why you're writing. Like, yeah. what is the story you want to tell? How big do you want it to be? Yeah, it's also like, what have I been doing? Like, right now I've been doing fantasy stuff with Galarian for, what, 10, 15 years. So I'm kind of really, I'm eager to do science fiction at this point because it's kind of, I'm eager to for a switcheroo or whatever like that. Um, it's both, I mean, on the magic side, on the, on the fantasy side of things, you've got to deal with the fact that um, people will assume that... Uh, just because it works this way in the in the real world medieval ages, that it works the same way in uh, the fantasy setting. So there's going to be a conflict there. You're going to be running up against um, that sort of conflict. So that makes that more difficult. With science fiction, you got the problem. It's like you have to make the science sound like it's going to work, even though it won't, because then it's not fiction. And so it's really it's it's I don't know. It's a tough one. A tough yeah. one to call. And to a certain extent, it's the same thing. It's just 
I mean, you look at something like Numeria where it's like, you know, dragons and lasers and mm -hmm. whether it's technological or magical or mystical or, you know, whatever, it's it's kind of just using fiction to tell stories about things that are interesting, I guess. Yeah, I, I certainly have more experience with, uh, with working with fantasy than science fantasy or science fiction. I tend to have a preference for fantasy personally, but, you know. When there's conflicts uh, uh, of of fact uh, in a in the world building that arise, whether it's shared world building or within your own, uh, better to ignore or explain. What kind of conflict of fact do you mean? Um, could be the type of you know type of creature that lives in a particular place, or the king or the ruler of a place, some something that rises like that. I think it depends on the nature of the conflict. If it's if it's something there, sometimes it's something you might be able to explain based on, oh, you know, well, some people say this creature's in this cave, and some people say this creature's in the cave, and then maybe you can make that the seed of an adventure. And other times it's like, you know, the name of the ruler who showed up here and this who started ruling in this year, the king's name was this, and then somewhere else it says the king's name was this, and then I think you know. I've, I've got two good examples of 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 the two ways you can deal with it. Um, for one, you could you could embrace it and say that that's there's always like in the real world there's multiple things going on that are like kind of conflicting each other, and so we've got this element within uh, Thassalon. There's this uh, nation called Zin Adasaril, and that is also the nat last name of the current queen of the Elven Kingdom of Kyonan. And the behind the scenes real reason is I made up both of those words and I forgot I used one already, <laughs> um, and that'll happen. Uh, but then somebody asked, like, why is Zinadasril named after the, the current queen of, of uh, the Elven Nation? And I was like, on one level, I was like, whoops. But the other was like, well, actually, Adasril would be an established Elven name. The nation of Zinadasril is about this, this rune lord of envy. And so I basically spun it in that way. It was a mistake, but it was fortuitous because the, the rune lord of envy saw this Elven Nation with this Adasril family. It was like super, they're beautiful, they're elegant, they have powerful magic, they have these awesome buildings. She took that name as her own, named her, it's like as if you could take their name, name your own town after it, and then it would become better. So it's sort of a case of like appropriating somebody else's, you know, legacy and all that. And it turns a mistake into something that actually adds layers to the world. Um, on the other hand, sometimes mistakes are things you should just say, yeah, that was a mistake. Um, the, one of my, uh, I wouldn't say favorite, but one of the, I guess, my proud nails was we've got Arastel, who's the god of families and uh, agriculture and like small town life. Uh, we started developing him and at one point took it in a direction that basically said, it implied that he was like, well, men are out there fighting, women stay home and, and take care of the house and all that and are as valuable to the society or something like that. And that uh, was basically, it was bringing in like, I guess, a real world sort of tradition that didn't make sense for a good god of families. And so that was a case where it was like, well, that was actually just an error. And you want to, at that point, fess up and say, yeah, we screwed up. That's not how it works. This is how it works. So you kind of got to weigh what you what the original intent was versus what the potential new flavor is. Yeah, and sometimes you sometimes you can also show it as a is a is a transition or as one thing being an outlier outlier. Like I know in uh, in my Kingmaker campaign, I introduced a cleric who who did who was acting more in some of those original rascal ways, but they were intended sort of to be as because there was a PC who followed a rascal. And there was this story arc then of the Erastal PC being like, no, dude, that's like not how this is supposed to work. And so they were able to engage with that, but not in a way that was saying like, this is how you have to do things. Yeah. Cool. All right, um, another question from Twitch. Uh, since you guys work primarily with tabletop RPGs, how often do game mechanics inform your world building design and vice versa? Uh, all the time, really. I mean, because it's 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 a game. Um, my preference is to uh, my preference is for the the organic, the world building element of things, and the, the rules should always support the the world. The world should not be defined by the rules. And so, you'd look at something like ghouls have always traditionally in um, uh, games. They, they paralyze you, but they don't paralyze elves. And that's always, to me, kind of felt like weird. Why is there elves are immune to ghoul paralysis? And so 
I took that as that's, that's a rule element, and then I decided that, well, m what if the first ghoul was actually originally an elf? And the fact that elves are immune is because it's sort of this weird legacy of this, this demonic disease that has spread through the ages. Um, that's kind of a callback to the fact that the, the elf was the first guy to, uh, to follow this, and that way elves are therefore immune to it. And um, it allows you to like start building in neat little sort of subsystems of, of lore to it that it looks like the rules, if you can make it look like the rules were invented to support something in world, even if the rules came first, then I think you're doing it right. And I think too, when you're looking at the stat blocks of monsters and you see like, oh, they are, they have this great resistance to fire, then that's going to, but they're weak to cold, that's going to inform, you know, who are they, go, what kind of monsters are they going to be triumphant over in battle? How are the people around them going to try to gather and fight against them and things like that? So you can sort of use that to determine when you have conflicts between non-human beings, like the dragons, so the dragons are fighting against the, you know, the dragons are fighting against the, the treants, and what's happening over here? Well, you know, the red dragon's gonna win, right? And so maybe the treants need to, to go get some help from the PCs or something else like that. One interesting thing that happens to us pretty regularly is, uh, is the art will suggest rules. Um, and a good example of this, as a spoiler, I, I hope I don't get yelled at from the higher powers, but in, in the upcoming bestiary, we've got the Remorons, which people, you know, everybody knows it's a big, the polar worm, it's super hot on the inside, and you get swallowed, you take 10d10 points of damage, and it's mean. <clears throat> oh, we got the Arden for the Remorons in the bestiary, and it looks super cool, and it's breathing fire out in this cone of just <laughs> And it got almost to the, de you know, the day of print, and I was like, wait a minute. These things can't breathe fire. <laughs> They've never been able to breathe fire. So the second edition Remoraz has a breath weapon. So it got it got worse. So is it projectile vomiting? Because I really want it to just be like it is now. <laughs> you sure that's fire? <laughs> <laughs> it just burns. Don't get it on you. <laughs> So this isn't a question, but oh. Twitch is really talking all about your tree ghost race now from your Joker. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe that's something you could do with the River Kingdom since there's so many forests there. Um, it's that's that's another thing too is is when when we have something like Galarian, which is already so well developed and everything like that. Um, there's always places. There's not always, but there's a lot. Oftentimes you'll you'll see places where something like a tree, a haunted forest type thing uh, would really work. And I think that actually works really well in Nadal uh, because mm -hmm. that area is so just tormented, but it's also got this long tradition of druid stuff going on in there. So that's where I would do something like that. And it's, I'm very into tortured dead people, yeah. as you know. Yeah, <laughs> I know people who can write awesome stuff about it. <laughs> um, so you mentioned Sandpoint as the setting for the first Pathfinder book. Mm -hmm. When it came to grabbing Sandpoint, I don't know if you made it for the book or not, but did you create Sandpoint first, or was it uh, Verizia first and kind of made the settlement for a Verizian culture? Um, it was Sandpoint first, really. I mean, Sandpoint um, was sort of an area that I had in my homebrew campaign back in the day. It's based on my hometown uh, uh, in Northern California. It's Point Arena, which translates from Spanish into Sandpoint. Um, and uh, it's got a it's got a lighthouse. It's got a, a cliffside where at one point the town dump was throwing your stuff over the cliff into the ocean. Um, so a lot of the stuff uh, there's like a lot of like the town road names and stuff are, are really brought in from uh, Sandpoint or from Point Arena. Sandpoint Point Arena. Uh, they had a sign back in like uh, 1890 or something. There was a sign outside of town with a mirror on it that, that asked people coming to town for the first time to see themselves as they would be seen by the people in town. And so. There's a lot of that elements that that goes back to like write what you know, write what you've heard about, and so Sandpoint was really kind of in my head right from the start. So um, when it came to Verissia, um, I basically started working on it. Wes Schneider and James Sutter and I were working a lot on Verissia for that first uh, Pathfinder adventure path. It was really kind of like let's build, expand on this nation that would feel like Sandpoint is part of rather than the other way around. So. And that, that goes back to the starting small type thing. You start small with a small town and then let it just ripple out and it kind of does a lot of its own work, sort of. Uh, 
How do we got here? We got a few more minutes for more. And the, um, if you're playing through the Kingmaker Adventure Path, that does a really great job of that because you start with your initial settlement and then the PCs have the choice of building their own settlements and then where are they going to build them? Are they going to choose to build a settlement in the forest? Okay, then they're going to have then they're going to have these natural resources. They're going to have more logging. Are they going to build one in the mountains? Then they're going to have they're going to maybe have some mining. They're maybe going to have more access to the sources of water. They're going to have all these other things that are going on. So mm -hmm. So I think that that if you if you're jamming that that's actually really good practice for building it because you've got this whole sandbox. To work Another with. thing I want to touch on real quick that we haven't really talked about is it's really important. Well, I guess when you start out with conflict, it's really important to know uh, who the bad guys are because that's really what in, in a game like Pathfinder, uh, you know, it's about fighting creatures and, and standing up against evil or whatever. If you're playing evil, standing up against good, I guess. Um, so. You, you want to look at these types of things, like, for, like uh, using goblins in his example for the first adventure. I, I knew I wanted like this kind of rapscallions who are all about like scavenging and stuff like that. And that's, that helped build up the idea that like they would be living in these old abandoned like statues and stuff like that. But they would basically live in the garbage of other, of other generations and other cultures. And that builds up a bunch of information about them themselves. Like the weapons they use are kind of brittle and they're, they're ramshackle. And it, it all kind of ties back together. But it also, gives a conflict for your, you know, it helps define uh, just as, as building like the resources and the traditions for, you know, the, the, the town that you guys are going to live in, you can do the same thing with the town that you're fighting against, I guess is what I'm going to mm -hmm. In addition to the people that you're fighting against and who your allies are, it's interesting to have those groups and those characters that the PCs could either ally with or work against. Yeah. That's one of the fun things to do in uh, in organized play where we have often reporting conditions where you can say, hey, the PCs worked with this person, hey, the PCs fought against this person, what did they think here? And then we can take that as we're going forward, we can use that data, and we do, to write our future adventures. And then we know, oh, they allied with this person, or oh, they attacked this person, and now this person's yeah. friends and family are going to be not so happy about that. And so yeah. then there may be consequences in the future. So that's one of the opportunities that you have both as, uh, and you can do that of course as a home GM too, but I generally am more lucky to think about things from the organized play perspective since that's my day job. We've got time for one more question. It's just uh, actually on the same question before, uh, huh? Leanne, your, your novels seem very rooted in the rules. I was wondering if you had a comment on that. I, was, kind of I actually really like James's explanation. It's true that I often uh, draw inspiration from yeah, game mechanics. You look at that and you're like, why does this work that way? And you try to think of an explanation that makes sense. And uh, these rules are really good for that. There is a lot of stuff in there that intuitively makes sense, but is also just just enough that you're like, okay, why like that? Why not some other way? So yes, there is a lot of that. Um, reading the rule book is actually kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, just. It's like doing archaeology, like trying to figure out why is why do wizards have fewer hit dice than fighters? And obviously, at one level, it's because fighters out there are exercising more, I guess. But magic should make you healthy, right? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe magic actually makes you sick, and that's that right there. You've got a, a world building element you can learn more. So, cool. Well, thank you, Van. Thank for you all. all. Thank you. Thank you for coming.